The U.S. Navy's decision to test a new stealth ship ended in a billion-dollar loss when the vessel was found to have major design flaws. The stealth ship, which was very clearly intended to be virtually undetectable by radar, and hailed as a major technological breakthrough when it was first announced. However, during its testing phase, it became apparent that the ship's stealth capabilities were significantly weaker than anticipated, and because of this it brought upon a lot of losses, and eventually ending in the cancellation of the whole project. What were the issues faced by this major stealth ship? Which is this stealth ship that brought upon billions of dollars of loss? And how did it manage to incur such high losses? Grab onto your life jackets as we set sail to discover what lies behind one of America's biggest losses in the naval field. In the early 2000s, the United States Navy began envisioning a new type of vessel, one that could operate in the areas near shore typically known as littoral. The U.S. Navy wanted a vessel that was fast, agile, stealthy, and most importantly versatile enough to handle a wide range of threats. Multiple contractors were approached to create their own design for the vessel, which would eventually be called a Littoral Combat Ship, or LCS. One of the first ships to be designed during this period was a new ship type, which came to be known as the Independence Class. It was designed by General Dynamics. One of the most unique features about the design by General Dynamics was its unique trimmer and design, which helped in the reduction of drag and at the same time provided increased speed. While initially hailed as a success, the project had exceeded its budget many times over. And eventually the performance issues convinced the U.S. Navy to scrap the Independence Class LCS with under 20 ships constructed. At the same time as General Dynamics was working on the Trimaran version of the LCS, Lockheed Martin was creating their own version of the literal combat ship, the Freedom Class. They commissioned and launched of the U.S. in Minneapolis St. Paul, which bears very little resemblance to the less traditional ships of the Independence Class. The Minneapolis St. Paul is a 387 feet long, and nearly 60 feet wide ship. The size of this ship allows it to reach speeds of around 52 miles per hour, which certainly meets the criteria laid out by the U.S. Navy during the initial research into literal combat ship capabilities. This vessel has a capacity of carrying a core crew of the size of around 35 to 50, as well as carrying several high speedboats on it. It can also launch helicopters and VTOO drones from its rear flight deck. Despite their many differences, both approaches to the LCS proved incredibly lethal and very capable of fulfilling their combat roles. The General Dynamics Independence class, which was launched in February of 2015, boasts an array of weaponry, including a BAE Systems MK-11057 mm cannon, a CRAM-11 cell missile launcher, and our RGN-184 naval strike missiles. This makes the vessel a formidable opponent for ships, aircraft, and enemies operating on the nearby shore. The Freedom-class vessels are similarly armed having RAN-166 rolling airframe missiles, Mark 50 torpedoes, and the same heavy deck-mounted cannons. Their monohulls also boast a weld deck, which allows boats to be launched and recovered from both the stern and the side. Both versions of the LCS incorporated pads or flight decks, though the Freedom-class incorporated aerial vehicles more comprehensively. The vessels were designed to carry one Sikorsky aircraft and the 60 RSC Seahawk helicopter and up to two MQ-8B Fire Scout aerial drones. Despite building around 30 vessels and neither literal combat ship design fulfilled the Navy's needs and both suffered frequent cost and performance issues. While the versatile modular mission packages were the thing that would have made both the LCS a smashing success, it never really materialized. When the LCS program ended the Navy renewed its focus on the capabilities of the current destroyer fleet. Since 1991, this was classified by the Arleigh class of guided missile attack ships. These heavily armed and armored vessels were specifically built around the AEGI's combat system. AGI's is a command and control interface that uses powerful computers and radar technology to guide weapons toward their intended targets. The Arleigh class vessels averages around 505 feet long and 66 feet wide, or about half the size of a modern Nimitz class aircraft carrier. They boast a complement of around 300 and utilize a wide range of weapon sensors and electronic warfare systems to patrol and protect the seas. These weapons are designed for use against aircraft and surface warships and to attack threats on the shore. They can be fired under fully automatic control or occupied by a six-person crew who can keep the weapons stocked with heavy ammunition. Despite their lethal directive, destroyers must be maintained like any other vessel. 
The crew members aboard perform maintenance on the ship's lifelines. This term of lifelines refers to various life ropes and chains that cover the decks of ships, providing something for sailors to grasp in bad weather or rough seas. In many cases, a lifeline can be the difference between going overboard or not. Many modern lifelines are made out of Kevlar, the same material used in bulletproof vests. These lines have a coating that must be frequently replenished due to the harsh, salty air. The coating keeps the material from deteriorating and ensures the lifelines can live up to their name in an emergency. Life aboard an early bird-class destroyer is not wholly different from living aboard any other military vessel. These destroyers are often referred to as the workhorses of the Navy. Though their primary mission is offensive, they need to be versatile enough to handle a wide range of jobs when called upon. In many cases, crews will be asked to join carrier strike groups, where they are tasked with protecting other larger ships. For several decades, the Arleigh-class destroyers remained an integral part of the United States Navy mission. In fact, all 70 of the ships that have been completed are still in service, owing to their toughness and ability to be upgraded with new systems as technology improves. Regardless of their overall success, the U.S. Navy did attempt to replace the first-generation Arleigh-class vessels with a brand new, highly innovative type of destroyer. This was the Zumwalt class, a new type of vessel designed with a focus on stealth modular mission capabilities and automation. These 600-foot long ships looked quite different from their predecessors, posting a cowl design that helps minimize their radar signature. The class is faster and operated with roughly half the crew required on a traditional destroyer. Their crewmen could easily be swapped out depending on the mission type, giving the class an impressive level of versatility. From Tomahawk and Sparrow missiles to submarine hunting weapons and vertical launching systems, these vessels remain incredibly formidable in battle situations. The flagship of the class that U.S. Zumwalt participated in has its Smuk 57 vertical launching system. Developed in the mid-1980s, this system consists of a series of small hatches placed in rows along the deck. Each hatch contains a vertical canister that can be loaded with various types of missiles. A part of the AEGI's combat system that serves as the basis for all modern U.S. destroyers, the MiG-57 battery is just 7 feet wide and 14 feet long. It allows missiles to be fired much faster than traditional batteries. This is not only integral to the Zumwalt's offensive capabilities, but to its ability to intercept and destroy incoming ballistic missiles from enemy sources. In the end, only three class vessels were constructed, though the program proved a viable replacement for the Arleigh Burke destroyer's construction costs ended up massively overrunning estimates. Each of the three completed ships cost around $7.5 billion when factoring in research and development costs. This proved far too expensive for the perceived benefit. Another primary issue with the stealth ship was its propulsion system, which was prone to breakdowns and required frequent maintenance. This not only made the ship unreliable, but also made it easier for enemy forces to detect and track. Additionally, the ship's hull was found to be prone to structural damage, leading to costly repairs and downtime. The Navy's decision to pursue the stealth ship was driven by a desire to maintain a technological edge over potential adversaries. However, the end result was a significant financial loss that could have been avoided with more thorough testing and design review. The failure of the stealth ship serves as a cautionary tale for the importance of thorough testing and review in the development of new technologies. While it is essential for the military to stay ahead of the curve in terms of technological advancement, it is equally important to ensure that new systems are reliable and effective before they are put into use. This requires a careful balance between innovation and caution and the Navy's experience with the stealth ship serves as a reminder of the potential consequences of getting that balance wrong. And so the U.S. Navy ended up canceling the program. Instead, they upgraded the versatile Arleigh Burke ships into a new configuration, installing the technology necessary to keep them competitive for another few decades. So, what do you think after watching this video? Do you think investing into these Zumwalt-class destroyers was a waste of money, time, and effort? Or do you think this failure is the stepping stone to success? Let us know in the comment section below and like and subscribe to keep yourself updated about all things submarine. And also don't forget to ring the bell icon.